In his third year as Cardinal head coach, Don Coriel faced a totally different challenge. For the task was now to keep the team on top instead of striving to get there. The year before, the Cardinals had shocked everyone by winning their first division title in 26 years. And each man on the team realized that the element of surprise would be gone in 1975. But in the new season to come, St. Louis would actually improve by winning 11, losing only three, and capturing a second successive NFC Eastern Division Championship. But it didn't come easily. Eight games, all but one of them victories, were decided in the last minute as week after week, St. Louis fortunes dangled on the second hand of the stadium clock. Because of this nerve-wracking habit, the team became nationally known as the Cardiac Cards. The powerful Big Red attack set a new team record with nearly 5,000 total yards. The Hart was the quarterback, and the passing partnership of Jim Hart to Mel Gray was the most feared in football. Gray caught 48 passes for 11 touchdowns. But he was not the only weapon. Both Earl Thomas and rookie Ike Harris caught plenty of passes as the Cardinals' high-powered air attack pierced enemy end zones game after game after game. For the second year in a row, the Cardinals' offensive line led the entire league in protecting the passer. They allowed only eight sacks, tying the NFL record. And depending more on physical power than finesse, they consistently gave Jim Hart extra seconds to release the ball. A measure of their success was that the entire right side, center Tom Banks, guard Conrad Dobler, and tackle Dan Deardorff was named to the Pro Bowl. Number 72, Dan Deardorff, at 6'3", 280 pounds, is one of the biggest and best offensive tackles of the game, and was again named All-Pro. Next to Deardorff was Dobler, with his reputation as the meanest man in football. The line escorted a ground attack consisting of the classic halfback fullback pairing. Terry Metcalf and Jim Otis, the sports car on the Sherman tank. Otis, in his fifth season, broke out to smash John David Crow's rushing record, gaining 1,076 yards and leading the conference with his straight-ahead power running. Behind Otis and Metcalf was a third back, Steve Jones, a smart, shifty runner who used his blockers well. All season long, Jones particularly excelled in the tight situations when crucial yardage was desperately needed. But of course, the big story was Terry Metcalf, the pacemaker for the cardiac cards. Despite special attention by enemy defenses, Metcalf set a new NFL record for combined net yardage and became only the third player in NFL history to score touchdowns five different ways. Like a runaway pinball bouncing through defenses, Terry Metcalf terrorized opponents each time he touched the ball.
against the Rams in the playoffs, Metcalf had one of his greatest days, accounting for 229 yards. But so furious was his futile effort, he spent much of the second half behind the Cardinal bench, hampered by severe leg cramps. Metcalf's courageous performance symbolized the fate of St. Louis this bright December day in the Los Angeles Coliseum. Though behind from the beginning, the 1975 team, known as the Cardiac Cards, never gave up until the final gun. The opener against Atlanta was a weather vane for the Cardinals' last-minute lifestyle. Terry Metcalf scored the first touchdown of the new season, but behind rookie Steve Bartkowski, the Falcons led 20-13 to late in the fourth quarter. Then quarterback Jim Hart beat a blitz and passed to Earl Thomas for the tying touchdown. This score set up a field goal try with merely three seconds showing on the clock. Jim Bakken's third field goal won the game as time ran out. St. Louis had scored 10 points in the final four minutes for their first victory of the year, and the team's tantalizing trend of last-second success had begun. Bartkowski, number 10 of the Atlanta Falcons, will never forget. In January, Bartkowski was the most publicized quarterback in college football and the number one draft choice of the NFL. When he arrived in Atlanta to sign his contract, the three TV channels interrupted their programming to announce that his jet had touched down. Last Sunday in his first game as a pro, Bartkowski skillfully manipulated the Falcon running attack. But when the St. Louis Cardinals stopped the ground game, Bartkowski was forced to pass and was not as successful. The furious pass rush and sophisticated zones of pro football have long been the bane of talented young quarterbacks like Steve Bartkowski. Every veteran quarterback who has weathered the corrosive climate of the NFL will explain that learning to decipher the defense is the most difficult task to master. Rare indeed are the rookie quarterbacks who achieve stardom in their first season and rarer still are those who excel in their first game. In fact, most veteran quarterbacks remember their first pro game as only a bittersweet memory. The ability to read and to anticipate defensive strategy gave 10-year veteran Jim Hart of the Cardinals the chance to defeat the Falcons. A safety blitz by Atlanta backfired when Hart anticipated the move and beat the blitz with a timely toss to Earl Thomas. Thomas' score added momentum to a Cardinal comeback that ended in a last-second victory when another veteran, 35-year-old Jim Bakken, kicked a 25-yard field goal that spelled defeat for Bartkowski's Falcons 23-20. Game two was in Dallas for the traditional hard-hitting rivalry with the Cowboys. After a first-half defensive battle which left bodies strewn about the field, the Cowboys led 7-3. But in the second half, the Raps came off and the two highest-scoring offenses in the East exploded for seven touchdowns. Mel Gray's last-minute catch ended a 52-point scoring avalanche and left the game tied at 31. But the first overtime game in St. Louis history had a disappointing ending as an interception won for Dallas. In a wild game that both teams deserved to win, sudden death had ended in defeat for the Cardiac Cards. On the next series, it was time for Jim Hart to turn to his favorite wide receiver, Mercurial Mel Gray, number 85. In just two quick plays, this prolific passing combination had the Cardinals right back in the game.
It took Jim Hart just one play to get back in it. Earl Thomas, the Cardinals' other wide receiver, covered 80 yards, and St. Louis again trailed by only four at 21-17. Midway in the fourth quarter, a fumbled punt gave Jim Hart another life. Jackie Smith's score brought St. Louis within a touchdown. With less than a minute to play, Jim Hart again went for his quicksilver wide receiver, Mel Gray. Last year, 11 of the Cardinals' 14 games went to the wire. This year, so far, it's two out of two. But this time, it was sudden death, and one mistake could be fatal. That one mistake came when, from the Dallas 26-yard line, Jim Hart passed down the middle to Leroy Jordan, who later explained, the ball just came to me, and Charlie Waters made a good block on the runback. I'm not a very good sprinter, you know. Jordan's return covered 38 yards, and then Roger Staubach took the Cowboys the rest of the way. Just about everybody agreed with Staubach when he stated afterwards, that was the most exciting game I've ever been in. Final score, St. Louis 31, Dallas 37. The next Sunday, back home against the Giants, St. Louis finally had a breather. The Cardinals stormed to a 23 to nothing halftime lead, paced by a blistering ground attack. For the first time in the Big Reds' history, two running backs rushed for over 100 yards in the same game. Terry Metcalf, 109 yards, were nearly matched by Jim Otis, who thundered through the Giants for 101. In a game that was as much a tribute to their superb offensive line as to Otis and Metcalf, St. Louis defeated New York 26-14. Meanwhile, out in St. Louis, the Cardinal offensive line met with much greater success. Dan Deerdorf led the way against the New York Giants from his right tackle position. On this play, Deerdorf post blocks his man to seal off the inside, while guard Conrad Dobler, number 66, pulls and kicks out on the linebacker, providing a funnel of daylight for quick Terry Metcalf, number 21. Metcalf is the type of runner who can make good use of his blocks while running a play that develops his diagram, but when the need arises, can also improvise and adjust. Against New York, Terry Metcalf and the offensive line were an unbeatable combination. When Metcalf wasn't carrying the ball, number 35, Jim Otis, took over. The hole that the offensive line provided was similar, but the style was different. While Metcalf outquicks, Otis overpowers. Otis barreled in to secure a 26-14 St. Louis victory that was as much a tribute to an excellent offensive line as it was to a couple of young running backs who each gained over 100 yards rushing for the day. Next on Monday night in Washington, the Cardinals resumed their heart-stopping heroics. Three times they fell behind, and three times they came back to tie on big plays by Mel Gray and Terry Metcalf. A 17-point tie was broken open in the fourth quarter when Washington scored 10 points to win. With a record of only two and two after four games, the Cardinals' ability to win their division was very much in doubt.
The comeback came against Philadelphia. The big play was replaced by a ground-hungry attack led by Jim Otis and highlighted by brutal blocking from every member of the offense. It allowed Otis, Metcalf, and Steve Jones to run wild as the Big Red displayed newfound running depth and set a cardinal record 278 yards on the ground. The victory over the Eagles was the start of a streak that would reach six games. Poor execution, fumbles, and dropped passes plagued Roman Gabriel's offense as only twice did the Eagles emerge from their labyrinth of mental errors to enter the St. Louis end zone. And as the Eagles were destined to learn, a sputtering two-touchdown offense would offer little contest to the consistent and balanced offensive machine that St. Louis Cardinal quarterback Jim Hart directed last Sunday. Even if it was a back-to-basics day for the big play Cardinals, any time number 21 Terry Metcalf has the football, it's always entertaining. And when Metcalf wasn't employed, a ponderous fullback named Jim Otis rumbled through the Eagle defenders. Carrying 23 times for 116 yards, Otis scored the Cardinals' first touchdown and set up the second one with a rampaging pop up the middle. Shortly thereafter, St. Louis quarterback Jim Hart squeezed off a six-point salvo to Jackie Smith in the Eagle end zone. The 13-year veteran made his only other pass reception of the day, an important one also, as this 39-yarder was soon followed by a field goal. There was little need for mega plays last Sunday, however, as the Cardinals' ground offensive ravenously consumed Eagle territory. Once in close, the reckless and raw power of Jim Otis was aimed successfully at the Philadelphia end zone to claim a commanding 24-10 lead. But the Cardinals had not concluded their back-to-basics revival, and while the uniform numbers were different in the fourth quarter, the game plan was not. Running almost at will through the Eagles' flagging defenses, number 34, Steve Jones, reaped his share of the 278-yard rushing harvest the Cardinals claimed for the day. Appropriately enough, the game's last play unfolded as a Cardinal touchdown run by number 27, Eddie Moss, who busted his way into the Philadelphia end zone to finalize a 31-20 victory. For the Eagles, it marked yet another cause for demoralization. While for St. Louis, victory meant a newfound balance and consistency. The next week, the big play was back as New York nemesis Mel Gray devastated the Giants with seven catches, two for long touchdowns. In his five years in the NFL, mighty Mike Mel Gray has caught ten touchdowns against the Giants. In this game, the defense played a vital role by intercepting three passes, one each by Larry Stallings, Ken Reeves, and Norm Thompson. It was number 43, Thompson, who made the biggest play of the day, when with New York ten seconds away from tying the score and forcing the cards into overtime, the big red cornerback stole Craig Morton's pass to save the game. Last year, the Cardinals snuck up on many teams because unlike the Rams and Redskins, they were not regarded as contenders, much less champions. 
But now, opposing teams' playbooks are stocked with tricks designed to fool a suspect St. Louis defense. Even though they hit hard and often, the Cardinals' defense leaks. A fact made quite evident by the Giants' Craig Morton, who sprayed their secondary with two touchdown passes. But St. Louis usually outscores their defensive mistakes because of Don Coryell's imaginative leadership and a wealth of talent on offense. The most glorious Cardinal is number 21, Terry Metcalf. A setback showered by accolades and endowed with immense ability. He is a drive wheel in St. Louis's delicately balanced offense. Metcalf is fronted by a superb line. Conrad Dobler, number 66, is a pulling guard who paves the way for Terry on power sweeps. So conscious were the Giants of a Metcalf sweep that the threat of it opened up an easy touchdown pass to Mel Gray, number 85. Quarterback Jim Hart was sacked for the first time in six games by blitzing linebacker Pat Hughes, number 56. But Hart's superb protection and deep drop allow him to exploit the vulnerable middle of zone defenses where the Quicksilver Cardinal receivers have a chance to show why their offense ranks first in the NFC. The Cardinals outlasted New York 20 to 13, as Mel Gray caught his 12th touchdown pass in 11 games against the Giants. No, St. Louis no longer creeps up on teams, they just whistle past them like the wind. The next week against New England, the defense again saved the day. This time on an interception by Pete Barnes on the last play of the game. In the 24-17 victory over the Patriots, Terry Metcalf scored all three Cardinal touchdowns as St. Louis won its third straight and vaulted into a three-way tie for first place in the NFC East. When Chuck Fairbanks coached at Oklahoma, wishbone quarterbacks fell out of trees. But in the pros, you can't recruit seven high school All-Americans a year to fuel your offense. And with Jim Plunkett injured, Fairbanks limps along with rookie Steve Grogan, number 14. Without Plunkett or a running game, Fairbanks' Patriots rely on the pass, a strategy his Sooners employed once every full moon. However, in number 84, Darrell Stingley, and number 18, Rabbit Bataha, the passing game rests in good hands. A healthy offense is not the problem of St. Louis head coach Don Coriel. His old San Diego State teams used to rank first in offense, and now so do his Cardinals. Number 21, Terry Metcalf, was personally drafted by Coriel because he annually destroyed his Aztecs with coast-to-coast -coast plays like this one against New England. Metcalf's 69-yard touchdown was the Cardinals' first score, and with the game in the balance, he scored their last on a gritty seven-yard sweep. While Don Coriel's high-octane Cardinals won 24-17, two coaches with underpowered defenses clashed in New York. 
Game 8 was a rematch with the Eagles, who led 23-7 midway into the third quarter and were driving for more. Then the Cardinals' all-pro cornerback Roger Worley made a vital end-zone interception, and the offense ignited at last. The trigger man was Jim Hart, who got perfect protection for the seventh time in eight games and shredded the Eagles' zone with pinpoint passes to seven different receivers. scrambled out of his pocket and into the Philadelphia end zone, St. Louis trailed by only two points. The Eagles continued to be victimized by the heart attack, which began a 66-yard drive that consumed nearly eight minutes of the final period and featured still another extemporaneous run by Jim Hart. This one for a crucial first down. With only three seconds on the clock, it was left to Jim Bakken, having his finest season in 14 as a Cardinal. The man they called Bags calmly kicked the 30-yard field goal that won for St. Louis. In an incredible come-from-behind victory, the Cardiac Cards had continued to live up to their nickname. Cause for a rash of interceptions he has suffered this season. A total that already exceeds his league leading low of last year. Hart explains why he's being sacked less, but intercepted more. It's a change in uh, number 17. He's just blowing some of the passes, that's all. It's not changing any philosophy of ours at all. I, we started the season, the first, first half of the season anyway, we uh, uh, had a very good record going for quarterback sacks. And I must admit that uh, perhaps uh, subconsciously I was thinking about protecting that record. And what I was doing, instead of giving our offensive line the credit, I was really discrediting them in saying that they can't hold them out long enough, so I'm dumping the balls too soon. So then after we got a couple sacks against the Giants, we just said, you know, scrap all that nonsense. Let's go back to throwing the ball like we know how. Setting up behind the safest offensive line in the NFL, Hart has only been sacked twice in eight games. The NFL record is eight for an entire season. Last Sunday's come-from-behind win over the Eagles, Jim Hart took full advantage of his protection. He unleashed passes that spiraled out for over 200 yards and one touchdown for his Cardinals. The Cards lead the NFC in total offense and have proven scoring potential. Thus far, their biggest problems have been on defense. Although many opponents have celebrated in the Cardinal end zone this season, the Big Red defense has shown a flair for coming up with performances which are a must for a contender. All-pro cornerback Roger Worley's interception turned back one eagle threat, and two second-half Cardinal touchdowns set the stage for veteran kicker Jim Bakken, who lined up from 30 yards out with one last chance to boot the Cardinals to victory.
The kick was good and helped the Cardinals retain their first place tie with this week's foe, the Washington Redskins. And for the second time this season, a Jim Bakken field goal in the final seconds had provided St. Louis with the victory. The value of having an unshakable pro like the 14-year veteran had again proved to be invaluable to a team vying for contention and their confident coach, Don Coriel. What were your thoughts on those last three seconds, Coach? Well, at a time like that, you just don't even take time to think. I thought of them, well, they'd be calling timeout, or because of the crowd making so much noise, we wouldn't be able to uh, hear the uh, holder, and they would delay things, but that wouldn't make a bit of difference to Bags. Jim Bach, and he wouldn't care. He'd just lean back there and relax a little bit more, kick the ball probably better. He's been doing it for a lot of years, and he certainly has come through when the pinch is on. Seven days later, the opponent changed, but the script remained the same. With first place at stake, St. Louis fell behind the Redskins early. Then, with their penchant for drama, excitement, and cardiac arrest, the Cardinals added Washington to the list of last-minute victims. Trailing 14-3 late in the third quarter, the big red attack came careening downfield on the lethal passing partnership of Jim Hart and Mel Gray. strike to J.B. Kane brought St. Louis closer, but on the next series, his perfect scoring pass was dropped in the end zone. Now, with 25 seconds left, it was fourth down, one last chance for St. Louis to tie the game. Amid the deafening din of Bush Stadium, the scene was set for the most controversial play of the 1975 season. With the Redskins claiming incompletion and the Cardinals claiming touchdown, confusion reigned supreme among players, officials, and fans alike. After a lengthy summit conference, the officials ruled a St. Louis touchdown. The Cardinals had dramatically tied the game and sent it into overtime. Washington never saw the ball again. Using Jim Otis on eight carries, St. Louis moved 55 yards downfield against the Redskins' proud old defense. On the last play of the game, Jim Bakken, as he had done to beat both the Falcons and Eagles, kicked the winning field goal. In their second overtime game of the year, the Cardinals had a wild 20 to 17 victory and sole possession of first place. George Allen is vexed by a different problem than Tom Landry. His offense is apt to stub its toe and weakly it must be bailed out by his defense. Allen's nickel defense is lined with interchangeable parts but laden with one golden player. Linebacker Chris Hamburger, number 55. Behind a stunning looping line, Hamburger blitzes down a path of least resistance and sets the tempo for redskin turnovers. Six weeks ago, Hamburger and his mates grew fat and happy on dumb St. Louis mistakes. And in the rematch, the Cardinals proved just as charitable. Redskin cornerbacks funneled the Fleet St. Louis receivers into the middle, where deep help was provided by safety Ken Houston, number 27. With Billy Kilmer injured, the Redskin offense became more daring under Randy Johnson, who tried to strong-arm passes to his double-covered outside receivers.
With the wide receivers denied the sidelines, Johnson found a sure route to success by dumping throws over the middle to tight end Jerry Smith, number 87. This strategy forced St. Louis to shore up the heart of their secondary and set up the old post corner move by tried and true Charlie Taylor, number 42. Taylor's role in the Washington offense cannot be overestimated. He is doubly valuable down deep, where his decoy patterns open the field for running backs like Mike Thomas, number 22. The Cardinals, like the Cowboys, don't defeat teams. They outscore them, and most of their games are not decided until the final gun. Against St. Louis, not even a big lead is safe, and when a team denies them the bomb, the Cardinals go underneath, where Mel Gray turns the secondary's cleats into ice skates. St. Louis crept back into the game when Hart connected with J.V. Kane dead in stride for six points as the Cardinals trailed Washington 17-10. With 25 seconds remaining, it was fourth and goal at the seven. Jim Hart pointed to Chris Hamburger, number 55, and alerted his team for a blitz. Hart's plan was to flood the extremities of the end zone with everyone but Mel Gray. The ball, Gray and Pat Fisher met in simultaneous rendezvous, and so did controversy. While one official indicated an incomplete pass and the Redskins trotted off joyously, the Cardinals collected to dispute the call and circle the officials like wild-eyed Indians around a wagon train. With the Redskins claiming victory and St. Louis shouting tie game, the officials huddled under a full moon where strange things can happen. And suddenly as Lon Chaney turned into a werewolf, the game turned into a 17-all tie. The Cardinals won the toss and relentlessly trudged after sudden victory as Washington slashed and tore at the ball. At the 20, the game was put in trust to Jim Bakken, whose flutter ball sailed St. Louis into undisputed first place in the NFC East. The next week against Joe Namath and the Jets, the Cardinals at last got out in front early and stayed there on three long scoring plays. Norm Thompson went 61 yards for the Namath interception. And Terry Metcalf burned a blitz by going straight up the middle for 52 yards. Jim Hart and Mal Gray continued their success against New York teams by combining for two touchdowns as St. Louis easily won its sixth straight, 37-6. Tiny Terry Metcalf led the robust St. Louis running attack into Shea Stadium, figuring to find a soft touch in the demoralized New York Jet defense. But sometimes, in a battle of contrast, the underdogs will lash out in frustration and play over their heads. New York came out strong to take an early 3-0 lead. Then their success made them too daring. Linebacker John Ebersole and safety Dallas Howell planned a risky double blitz, but Terry Metcalf split the gap into a wide-open secondary. Mm -hmm. 
Metcalf's touchdown put the game back in proper perspective. And number 17, Jim Hart, added his part with a bombing run through the wide open spaces of the New York deep zone. Mercurial Mel Gray scored twice, and Jim Hart retired after three quarters with some impressive stats. 11 for 13 for 242 yards. The other, more widely known quarterback, didn't fare so well. Living legend Joe Namath leads the NFL in only one category for 1975, interception. His 22nd of the season was carried back 61 yards by Norm Thompson to close out a 37-6 St. Louis victory that kept the Cardinals solidly on top in the Eastern Division. On Thanksgiving Day against the Bills, the Cardinals' six-game winning streak came to a sudden end. Seven turnovers contributed to a decisive defeat. The loss dropped St. Louis into a tie with Dallas for the division lead and set up a showdown for first place the next week with the Cowboys. Determined to avenge their overtime loss to Dallas, Don Coriel's game plan was to go for the big play right from the start to get as many points as possible against the doomsday defense. Behind the long-range bombing of Jim Hart, the game was never in doubt. The Cardinals scored touchdowns four of the first five times they had the ball. Hart's brilliance was helped immeasurably by great catches. The most spectacular was an unbelievable reception by Terry Metcalf, who took the ball between three Cowboys. The offensive explosion gave St. Louis a commanding 28-3 halftime lead and allowed the Cardinal defense and special teams the unaccustomed luxury of protecting a large lead. In the second half, great coffin corner kicking put Dallas in a hole, and the Cardinal defense, with a strong rush on Roger Staubach, kept them there. Roger Worley intercepted three Staubach passes, two of them in the fourth quarter, as the Big Red won their biggest game of the season. The tie for the lead in the NFC's Eastern Division had been broken. St. Louis was in first place to stay. It helps to stay fit if you expect to keep the pace in the NFC's Eastern Division. For the second straight year, the Washington Redskins, the Dallas Cowboys, and the St. Louis Cardinals were engaged in a down-to-the-wire dogfight for two playoff spots, and St. Louis strongman Conrad Dobler wanted to be ready. Last week's most crucial matchup had a Don Coriel's eight and three Cardinals against Tom Landry's eight and three Cowboys. And the great game possibilities made everybody smile. This quarterback Jim Hart was testing a tender knee under scrutiny of the Dallas Cowboys. In the previous 11 meetings between the two teams, Dallas had won nine times. And the confident Cowboys looked to a wealth of big game experience to pull them through once again. St. Louis hopes rested with a gimpy need quarterback and a gently lofted prayer. Somehow the prayer escaped three Dallas defenders and nestled snugly in the grateful grasp of terrific Terry Metcalf. Metcalf couldn't quite believe that one himself, but Jim Hart was on the right track and there was nothing sloppy about touchdown number two. Tiny Mel Gray took his turn in the end zone as the eager Cardinals gratefully accepted a surprising early advantage. A repeat documents the classic NFL bomb. Hart simply threw the ball as far as he could, and Mel Gray outran everybody in a blue shirt.
The St. Louis bombing run set a tempo that Cowboy quarterback Roger Staubach was unable to match. Without a consistent pass rush from the front four all season, St. Louis depends on team defense, like a surprise double blitz to keep an opponent off balance. With Staubach properly confused, Jim Hart continued to chew up the Dallas defense with impeccable pass protection from an offensive line that has allowed him to be sacked only six times all season. The hands belong to Ike Harris, a fourth round draft choice in 74 who played instead in the WFL. Harris finally came to St. Louis this season and soon took a starting position away from Earl Thomas with catches like this one. Hard to Harris set up a just enough touchdown vault by number 34, Steve Jones. And amazingly, the St. Louis Cardinals took a 28 to three halftime lead over the unbelieving Dallas Cowboys. There have been many seemingly hopeless predicaments in Cowboy history and almost as many impossible comebacks. So when Roger Staubach shifted back into his shotgun to start the second half, he had to believe anything could happen. What appeared was the ghost of Roger the Dodger, the Heisman Trophy winner of 1964, complete with the U.S. Naval Academy jump pass. With nothing to lose, Staubach opened things up and the Cowboys began to move down the field, working the middle with tight end Billy Joe Dupree, number 89, and then swinging outside to running back Robert Newhouse, number 44. In the second half alone, Staubach completed 18 of 29 for 222 yards. And when he couldn't throw, there were other ways to get the job done. In the late afternoon chill of Bush Stadium, Staubach passed and scrambled Dallas back into contention as two touchdowns shrunk the Cardinal lead to 11 points. But Dallas had started this comeback too late. Time was running out and Staubach was forced to throw nearly every play into a swarming prevent defense. The result was inevitable. Cornerback Roger Worley ended two fourth quarter threats with goal line interceptions to nail down a solid 31-17 St. Louis victory and vault the Cardinals into sole possession of first place in the NFC East. The victory plus a Detroit loss clinched a second consecutive playoff berth for a team that didn't learn to win until Don Coriel arrived from San Diego State with a plan. Now, terrific Terry Metcalf and the Cardinals are anxious to show the world that the best is yet to come. Hart had a real hot hand. In third and seven in the first quarter, Hart elects to go to the air and hits Mr. Excitement himself, Terry Metcalf, for a 30-yard TD pass. And Metcalf, of course, shows his enthusiasm for that play. Hart again elects to go to the air once again, hitting another speedster coming out on the wide side and the left side of the field, a 49-yard touchdown pass to Mel Gray. St. Louis led 14 to three. Hart again, still looking for Gray. This time hits him on a six-yard TD pass. And the Cardinals take a commanding lead early in the game, 28. The next week in the wind and rain of Chicago's Soldier Field, Jim Otis ran for 147 yards to go over 1,000 for the season, and the Cardinals rolled to a 34-0 lead. With old pro Jackie Smith returned from an injury and halfback Steve Jones playing in the place of Terry Metcalf, St. Louis buried the Bears and clinched the Eastern Division title for the second straight season. In Chicago, the track was slower, but the horses were just as fast. Number 80, Bo Rather, turned a flanker screen into a 50-yard burn for six points. 
The Bears' nemesis was number 35, Jim Otis, who gained 145 yards and joined John David Crow as the Cardinals' only 1,000-yard runner. Compared to a stallion like Terry Metcalf, Otis is a dray horse, but his heavy-duty running has kept St. Louis in first place in the NFC East. Balanced is the beauty of the Cardinal attack, and with number 81, Jackie Smith, healthy, the St. Louis offense is brutal. The Cardinal roster is talent rich. Subbing for a Terry Metcalf, Steve Jones, number 34, scored twice and helped St. Louis bury the Bears 34 to 20. Against Detroit in the season's 14th game, Terry Metcalf returned to the lineup and set an NFL record for net yardage. Jim Otis won the NFC rushing title, breaking a team record while doing it. Against the Lions, rookie Jerry Latton became the third big red runner to go over 100 yards in a game. It included the longest run of the season in the NFC, as the Cardinals won their 11th game, most ever in St. Louis, and matching the record of the 1925 and 1948 Chicago Cardinals. In 1974, the St. Louis Cardinals were the Cinderella team of the NFL, winning their first division title in 26 years. This season, they repeated as Eastern Division champions of the NFC, playing the same brand of fire wagon football. With the weakest pass defense in the conference, the Cardinals relied on outscoring their opposition rather than holding them. Jim Hart and Mel Gray, number 85, were the most potent pass-catch combo in the NFC. Eleven times this season, they combined for touchdowns. The emergence of Jim Otis, number 35, as the NFC's leading ground gainer, added still another weapon to the Cardinals' arsenal and gave a new credibility to the play-action pass. Eight times the Cardinals fell behind this season, only to come back and win on the wings of their high-flying offense. Of all the division winners, they are probably the most entertaining, and they finished the season with 11 victories the highest one season total for the Cardinals since the team moved to St. Louis in 1960. The playoff game against the Rams was the last game for the Cardinals. Following the finest season in St. Louis history, the team laid an egg in Los Angeles. Two interceptions returned for touchdowns with the key plays as the Rams erupted for 28 points in the first half. Throughout the game, there were ample signs that this indeed was not to be the Cardinals' day. The odds were overwhelmingly against them, as they had all season. The cardiac cards refused to give up and came roaring back on the wings of their explosive offense.
Los Angeles lead was insurmountable. And for the second straight year, the Cardinals' season had come to a sudden, disappointing end in the playoffs. However, being twice snake-bitten by the Rams' secondary, Hart began working flare passes to his running backs. They were at least safe and proved productive. Once in close, bruising running back Jim Otis put the Cardinals on the board. But lo and behold, kicker Jim Bakken missed the extra point. And now Jim Hart had to make everything bread and butter. And who better to butter than his two most reliables, Terry Metcalf and Mel Gray. On this play, Metcalf chipped in 19 yards. And then after a penalty, Gray came up with a drive-saving sideline reception. At the Ram 11, it seemed Hart was wearing his Mitchum deodorant because he had all-day protection before he fired to Mel Gray to make it 28 to 16. Plus he's caught a pass for 34 yards. And I believe is Dwayne Crump, the short man at the 30 up to the 35 yard line heading to the near sideline. Run down at the 40 yard line. At their 40. <laughs> Metcalf slipping and sliding and regaining his footing and reaching the 48-yard line, taking a second down two. You see he's on the inside of the tight end. There's a sucker play. Metcalf, boy, for a little guy, he can run hard, and he picks up the first down at the 46. Hart. Rid of it to the far sideline to Otis. Otis down to the 30 to the 25 and out of bounds at the 23 yard line. Jim Hart gives to Metcalf, dancing up the middle to the 16 yard line. Hart fakes it to Otis. Sideline throw to Kane, who holds on to this one, has the first down and reaches the nine yard line before being shoved back. Okay. It has now reached the Ram 9. It is Steve Jones. Jones inside the 5 to the 4-yard line. Pick up a 5 on the play. It'll be second down goal. Jim Hart going straight up the middle, and Otis scores for St. Louis. They do the best they can to move this football down the field. Second down 6. Cardinals at their 24-yard line. Big red trailing. And Hart going to put it upstairs. Got his receiver on the far sideline. That uh... Jim Hart, who has not been sacked today, hitting Metcalf at the 40, and Metcalf just short of the first down is dropped at the 42. Has uh, suffered from a bruised hip coming into this game. Cardinals going to try to pick up the first down and keep the drive going at Otis with great second effort, will be very close for it at the 44-yard line. He's got it. Cardinals first down at their 44, early in the third period. Jim Hart. Oh, he's wide open in the inside. And Metcalf there we are. at the 50, down to the 40-yard line. Metcalf is down to the 37 of Los Angeles. First down. The linebackers of the Rams are getting an awful lot of depth. They're not concerned about the run that much. They're worried about the pass. This time they ran a delay pattern, as we talked about earlier. They're trying to get the ball to Metcalf as many ways as they can. He ran a delay pattern underneath Otis that time, and he's wide open. And you see him here making a, a big play and a nice gain for the first down. So the Cardinals moving on this opening drive of the second half. That play covered 20 yards. 11 minutes, 20 seconds left to play in the third period. Cardinals have the ball at the Ram 37. This drive's kickoff. Haven't given up the football yet, but they haven't scored either. They've got two downs to get the two yards. And they don't need field goals at this point. Metcalf. There he is. He's got it. Bill Simpson dragging him down from behind. That may be a face mask. Looked that, like it was. The way that flag was dropped. And that would put the uh, Cardinals down around the 10-yard line if indeed that was the case. 
Simpson, number 48, coming up in the secondary. Metcalf doing a good job. Jim Otis out in front doing a good job of blocking on the play. Face mask here, as you can obviously see by Bill Simpson, number 48. With the Cardinals, as much time as they've taken here, they just have to get some points out of it. Otis up the middle goes to the 12, maybe the 11-yard line. Pick up a four. It'll be second down six. You know, see if they try to work on Jackson over here on the left side. They haven't given him much business yet. Hart, protection is good. He's got all the time he needs, and he has got a touchdown. touchdown. Easy six points to Melgrave. Even though we were behind, our people had the competitiveness to really come back and battle back, and uh, I actually thought we had a chance to win the ball game. And even the last seconds of the game, our people were playing with as much intensity as if the game depended on making that touchdown. I'm very proud of them for that. They've been that way all year long. They're a great group of men. Put everything they've got into everything they do on every play. No matter who we're playing and who's ahead. Coach, what about the Cardinals' chances next year? I think we're a developing team. I think we'll continue to get better. You bet we'll be better. Be better every year. 